Join me as I talk with people who express their creativity in ways that can inspire the rest of us to recognize our own creativity. And if you enjoy these conversations, please like, subscribe, and share them. Hello and welcome to Creativity Conversations. This is episode 49 and I have the pleasure of speaking with Rolf Evenson today. <laughs> Almost got that wrong. <laughs> I'm going to have to rehearse After it. After all of our prep, right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so regardless of how we've just started out, we are going to move on through and see how creative we can get in our conversation today. And as I usually do, I'm going to read Rolf's bio, and then we will see where the conversation goes. And hopefully this will be an inspiring conversation for you all. So, Rolf's curiosity about the human dimension of leadership developed early. After receiving a BA in philosophy, he spent 15 years leading wilderness expeditions, outward bound courses, climbing the Great Walls of Yosemite, paddling the length of Lake Superior, and leading dog sled expeditions. Yeah, let's find out more about that later. These adventures provided a virtual laboratory for studying the human capacity for both high and low performance under duress. Rolf has a master's degree in architecture and specialized in medical facilities and surgery centers working with interdisciplinary design teams on complex projects he developed a profound curiosity about what made some project teams come together brilliantly while others failed along the way he was extremely fortunate to discover fundamental principles for how the human mind works a crucial almost always overlooked variable in organizational change in human performance. In 1999, he founded ClearMind Advisors, a global leadership consultancy specializing in helping leaders from around the world lead with clarity, insight, and confidence. He's a trusted mentor to leaders from renowned me medical institutions, space research labs, telecom and power companies, and global name brands in the US, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. He loves nothing more than to explore with his clients what it means to be fully connective, creativity, sorry, creatively engaged, and wholeheartedly alive. So let's be creative. Let's dive in. I'm looking forward to it. Great. So talk to me about <sighs> how you see the nature of creativity as you've experienced it over the years in this really wide range of experiences that you've had. You might not call it creativity, but I'll let you explain it. You know, I've been fascinated with um, two major themes, I think, in my life. One is adventure, which explains uh, my spending 15 years in obvious adventure situations, uh, climbing and canoeing and dog sledding and all of that. And then I realized that the greatest adventure of all was the adventure of life itself. And that's what I feel like I'm doing now is, is when I work with clients is uh, stepping into the adventure of life itself. With creativity, um, I've always been fascinated by creativity. Um, I've loved music from the get-go. And I've always been fascinated by the human capacity to create beautiful music from nothing. <clears throat> in, in my rock climbing days, um, I noticed that there, there was, the, I didn't call it this at the time, but I noticed that there were days when I was I could climb beautifully, really uh, difficult pieces of rock. And then other days I couldn't at all. And I, and I, I realize now what, that, what, what was going on is that um, when things were going well, I was in a state of creative flow. Mm -hmm. And I was solving the problem of, of the rock cliff in that, from that state. 
and I and I noticed that that um, brought tremendous effectiveness, um, much better results, but also far more enjoyment. And then in architecture, um, I got really fascinated by the idea that human beings can sit around a table and share ideas that then become sketches that then evolve into construction drawings that then evolve into a construction prog uh, project that ultimately results in being able to walk through the door of a beautiful building and experience it in three dimensions. Just think about the power of that for a moment. Sitting around the table, we were human beings sharing ideas. What are ideas? Ideas are thoughts. What are thoughts? I think of thoughts as coalesced energy. Where does the energy come from? Where does the thought come from? And all we're doing is sharing those, those thoughts and we're doing it verbally. We're saying words, the sound waves are traveling through the air, striking our eardrums, which inspires our own thoughts about the thoughts you just shared. And you're just, you're spinning a tapestry of thought, ideas, and you're jotting some ideas down on the table, on, the, on, the, on the, uh, your notes. And then, and then it evolves into a sketch so I just, I just am utterly fascinated with the, um, the human capacity to create something from nothing. If the, if the people listening to this um, podcast were to just look around the room that they're sitting in, everything that they see started with a thought. The building that they're in, the room that they're in, the desk that they're sitting at, the chair that they're sitting in, the light that's lighting the room, the computer, the software of the computer. <laughs> I mean, on and on and on. It all started with a thought. So I have a question for you. I'm going to jump in here if you don't. Yeah, mind. please do. Why, why does that matter that you're even bringing this up now? We already know you're speaking to the choir with me on this, but for people who say, well, so what? Yeah, of course, it's obvious. Everything starts with thoughts, but so what? How is that useful to know? How could we think differently as a result? Well, understanding how the mind works and understanding the nature of, of um, how human experience is created whether it's an architecture, a work of architecture, or um, the depression you're feeling on a, on a given day, it all starts with thought. And so understanding how it works is infinitely helpful in making good decisions about how that can lead towards digging yourself a deeper hole if as an individual or a team you're struggling um, or creating magic. I was once called uh, by a CEO to, to, and he asked if I could help his sales team who, um, and the reason he called was because he had just found out that they had canceled all of their weekly sales meetings. And he freaked out because their sales were in the tank and they, they desperately needed to um, find a way to perform at a higher level. And so the thought that his sales team had canceled their meetings was flabbergasting to him. It turned out that, that the, the culture on that team had gotten so bad, they couldn't stand each other. They didn't trust each other and they, they couldn't stand being in the same room together. It was bad. He asked me if I could help and I said, well, I have no idea, but I'd be happy to sit down and chat with each one of them and, and get a sense of whether I might be able to help or not. So I sat down with each 
team member and I found out that they had um, an extensive history with each other and they all had lots of reasons why they didn't like each other, didn't trust each other, why it had been difficult, why working there sucked, all of that. So I asked them if, if, um, if a miracle could happen and it could actually honestly and authentically feel better to come to work and to work together and they could start experiencing success together, would they be interested? And I said, I acknowledge that, that you're probably skeptical about whether that's possible or not. I would be if I was sitting in your chair. But if it were possible, would you be interested? And everyone said, yes. So we went off site for three days and I simply um, talked about the mechanics of how the mind works. The mind leads us through life and we happen to have the owner's manual to how it works. And so once they started seeing that their, think, their experience was coming from their own thinking and how they were thinking about the situation and how they were thinking about each other, their mind started to settle and they started to solve their own problems. They started to figure out for themselves how to, to redesign the system, if you will, for how they work together and how they try to uh, achieve sales. In the end, we found out when we got off site, most of the team was making plans to leave the team privately because they were so miserable. They were, they were this close to losing three fourths of their team. In the end, nobody left and their sales increased 263% over the next six months. And that was with no sales training, no communication training, no um, conflict resolution training. They figured it all out themselves simply because they now understood how the mind works and where their experience was coming from, their mind settled and they started giving each other the benefit of the doubt rather than blaming each other. And their minds were freed up to do what minds do naturally and that is to create. They created a whole new future for themselves and for that com company. This is a big deal. It is a big deal. I mean, that's the difference between a team that understands how the mind works and a team that doesn't. So can I ask you here, when you're talking about how the mind works, are, are you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to add some leading bits to it. Are you referring to what gets in the way of being in a flow state in order to create, whether how our moods affect our thinking, because that's those are things that in my experience, people don't really think about. If they're in a bad mood, they just try to gut their way through it. And oftentimes the results are not very good. Right. And, and we all have done that, right? We've all tried to force things or um, power our way through situations and occasionally that works but typically it's less far less effective and it's way less creative and it's way less fun it's interesting to me it's not a surprise that the more creative we are the more fun we are we're having typically it seems that we were designed to thrive creating and, and when you look at three and four year olds, I have a three year old granddaughter. And when you watch them play, it just seems so crystal clear that creativity and joy are a number one, are, are first of all, they're built in. We're born with the capacity to create, we're born with the uh, capacity to solve problems, and we're born to enjoy the process. We love learning. 
I'm sorry, I'm losing track of the question. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> sorry. Well, that's great. I mean, we can just go wherever this is going to end up going. But what, what I'm thinking about as you're talking is that when we, whether it's in business or not, but since we're in the business context today, we can play there for a while, is that how important it is to realize that we have so much more flexibility in terms of what we, you know, that famous saying, don't believe everything you think, that we have far more flexibility in how we're going to think about something and how seriously we're going to take a bad mood or whether we're going to stay in the mindset of blaming somebody else or judging them or assuming something or making some expectations about some, something that is supposed to happen or we want to have happen because if we're in a creative mode the, all of that is on the sidelines we're just open to something some new ideas some other possibilities and we're not focusing on what isn't working and why we can't do something Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I am. I'm thinking of a story um, of a uh, the father of a friend who was a uh, designer of of state parks in Colorado. He spent a whole career designing and building most of the state parks in Colorado, and he decided to retire um, with much fanfare and awards given, and so on. And he decided that the first thing he wanted to do in retirement was volunteer in, in the local um, first grade class, the local elementary school. So here's this man who's run million dollar budgets and had thousands of people working for him on day one in first grade, sitting on a tiny little chair with his knees up around his chin, feeling insecure, feeling out of place. And the seven-year-old girl sitting next to him apparently noticed his discomfort and put her hand on his knee and looked him in the eye and said, don't worry, it's a lot like kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think this, this ability to create and this ability to access a deeper wisdom about things is built into us. I was reading a, a book um, the other day <clears throat> called Stealing Fire. It's actually a, a fascinating book. And uh, talking about how um, various organizations in the world are going out of their way to try to unpack what this flow state is about. And I find these, you know, these discussions absolutely fascinating. But a lot of them are looking for, for um, a ticket for getting there faster. And it's, it's all about doing something to achieve that state. Meditating, for example, to achieve that state. Or um, with the Navy SEALs, part of their strategy is to drive themselves to exhaustion to get to that state. Um, I think the story about the, the girl in first grade describes or is a metaphor for how it's actually our default setting. I mean, we can do stuff to get there. That's, a, I would call that an additive approach. Learn a new process, a new technique for being more creative. But in my experience, um, in our natural state, when our minds are settled, Creativity comes out beautifully and naturally. It's, it's our um, default setting. So how do we get our minds to settle? Especially if you're leading a company, you're a senior member of an organization, and you're concerned about your board, you're concerned about metrics, you're concerned about deadlines. How do you settle your mind? 
So I was working with the, um, the CEO of a global company just last week. And when we start a, a year of co uh, working together, of co uh, executive coaching, um, we'll usually carve out three days to spend together um, to kind of lay the foundation of understanding and, and common language uh, so that we can uh, build our year of working together on, on a agreed upon foundation of understanding. And uh, since b with COVID, we did it virtually. So he was staying at his beach house on the ocean by himself. And, and we were communicating via Zo uh, Zoom, just like you and I are. And in our very first session, uh, I was talking to him about the power of slowing down and what the pace of the, of the three days looked like and how often we would meet and how long we would talk and how, how long his breaks would be. And I could tell that he was getting a little uncomfortable. And I asked him uh, what he was thinking. And he said, well, I've never slowed down in my life. I've been going 100 miles an hour for as long as I can remember. In fact, my own son and my wife recently have asked me, couldn't you just take a few minutes off? Everything has a purpose. Everything has a, has a velocity. And it's all about getting results. When he finished, there was a pause. And then I said, well, I guess the next three days then are going to be pure hell for you. <laughs> <laughs> Were they? And we had a good laugh about that. Um, then we proceeded um, to talk about why why that is, you know, what happens when the mind relaxes? What happens naturally when the mind settles? We came back after a two hour break for our second session and I asked him, well, what did you do during the break? And I'd given him some homework to consider, but I'd also said, look, oftentimes when people have been driving hard for years, as their minds settle, the first thing that occurs to them from their wisdom is, they need a nap. <laughs> I'm tired. So we come back for the, the second session and I asked him, so how did the break go? He had a two hour break and he was kind of chagrined. And he said, you know what? I slept through most of it. It was the first time I'd taken a nap in the morning on a work day in my life. Right? Yeah. And I said, so how did, how does it feel? And he said, it was really nice. <laughs> but then ironically, in, in response to the rest of your question, the board and the pressures and the expectations, I mean, the fact that you, you can settle your mind and you can experience some rest and relaxation doesn't change the, the environment that you're working in and the demands of that environment. So prior to our taking this break, this, this three days, he had talked to his leadership team, his wife, and everybody that he was connected with on a daily basis and, and gave them a heads up. I'm taking three days for professional development. This is really important to me. Um, I would really appreciate it if you just give me that space. Um, do your best not to call me. Don't email me with problems. Unless the house is burning down, I don't want to hear about it. So the very first after, afternoon after our second session, he's relaxing and he gets a text message from one of his team members with some fire at work. And he immediately goes internally into anger at this person for not honoring his request for privacy during these three days. And then he proceeded to try to figure out how to help them. And then he just was trying to decide whether he should respond via text or email or not at all, and whether he should respond to the fact that they were, in, they were interrupting his leadership retreat, which was the first time he'd taken for himself in years. So in short, he got really wound up about it. And then his wife called him. Now this is the same wife who I had interviewed earlier and she had thanked me profusely for creating this space for him to get away from things. But in the heat of the moment, she forgot. 
and she called him with a problem that one of their kids was having at school. So now he's angry at his wife for forgetting how important this time off was to him, but loving his wife and loving his son, he got caught up in trying to solve the problem. Then he took a break for, for dinner and after dinner, his wife called again. And this time it was to let him know that his, wife, his son had been chosen athlete of the year and the award ceremony was gonna be Friday morning, which was our last, my last day with him. And would he mind leaving the retreat to go to the award ceremony? Long story short, he, that was the rest of his day and he goes to bed and he can't sleep and he's riled up and he's thinking about all this stuff. He gets no sleep. He finally gets up at 4.30 in the morning, just completely exhausted and frustrated. And that's the state that he arrived in when we started at seven o'clock that morning, totally frustrated. And, and I just, I laughed and I said, isn't it perfect? This is what life, this is what happens. This is, re, this is real life. Now let's look at all of that through the lens of what's actually going on. And as we talked, he settled back down. The next day we came together and I said, so how did it go on your second afternoon? And he said, I went for a walk on the beach and for the first time in my life, I noticed the sound of seashells crunching under my feet as I walked on the beach. We've had this place on the, on the beach for eight years. I've been walking on that beach hundreds of times over the last eight years. I have never heard the sound of the crunch of seashells. And he described walking on the beach and just being like a kid ecstatic over just looking around to see if everybody else heard the crunching sound. And then he described three women walking by, all talking at the same time and no one listening. And he, and he said, have you noticed how nobody listens to each other? We're all too busy talking. So he started seeing his life in a whole new way. He started seeing that there were all these, that the external world was real and that there were these real demands being placed on him, but that his experience of those demands was 100% coming from how he was thinking about it. So that the demands were one thing, but how he experienced them, his emotional state, that was entirely between him and him. That was a revelation. Yeah. I think that's such a, it's a great story. The, the two words that popped out when you were describing it was caught up and how most of us live that way. Aside from the other points that you brought up about people rarely listening to each other. I mean, I've had dinner parties with eight people and there were four conversations going on at the same time. It happens yeah. in the boardroom. It happens in offices. It happens at lunch. You know that yeah. everybody's got an agenda in their head and it's so important for them to get it out there that there's no room for anything. There's no room for any kind of a flow to come in to anything. Right. Yeah, it was really interesting to talk to him um, a few days later when he got back to the office and he was sitting in the boardroom by himself and we were on, uh, on a Zoom call. And I could just, his whole body posture was different. He was relaxed. I asked him, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing really, really well. I'm feeling great. And I said, well, have all the problems been solved? And he said, no, none of them have been solved. But now I just know we're going to be fine. I know that we're going to solve them. I know how to approach them uh, without getting caught up in them. That's so big. That, that insight is so big because when you think about it, we're really taught, we're conditioned to get caught up in things. Right. That's commitment, right? You really get in there and you work it and you just yeah. drive yourself through it. But to not get caught up sounds like 
you don't care or it's so hands off that it just doesn't sound right. I had a client once who was uh, just a brilliant, brilliant at what he did. He was a regional director for a, an international brand company and his region was the highest uh, performing region in the whole company. But the CEO called me uh, because they had gotten some HR complaints about this person that had gotten serious enough that they felt like they were being, they had to do something. They desperately didn't want to fire him because he had the best running organization in the company. They were the, the major profit center for the company in the US. And yet the, they couldn't ignore the HR complaints either. And so uh, I chatted with him to see if I could uh, establish some rapport and it, it, um, we were able to do that. And he agreed to come out and see me in Colorado where I, I live. We spent four days together. And I'll never forget on day three, he was, he was just, he was just, uh, he was just an amazing guy. He was a beer of a man, kind of a bull in a China shop, kind of a guy. And uh, uh, New York, he had a strong New York accent and very opinionated, very strong um, businessman. And uh, on day one, I just, I mean, day three, I, it just, I could just see that the penny dropped in some way. He just, something occurred to him. He was, he kind of had that far away stare and I, I asked him what, what happened? And he said, I just realized that <clears throat> rapport with human beings is actually a thing <laughs> and that it matters it makes it it's a it's a thing that makes a difference i i thought that all that mattered was results and then i had the insight that half my organization are made up of people who are all about results and love breaking records and love being a part of a, a team that's breaking records and could care less if, less if we're hugging each other and being nicey nice to each other. We just wanna kick ass and break records. But the other half of the organization, the company was uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And the, the other half of the organization were um, the people in the ice cream making production plants in Vermont, <clears throat> many of whom were old time hippies. And he realized they wanna know you care first. There, that's where all the complaints are coming from. And he had, he realized I have no rapport with them so my rapport with, the, with half of the organization is just natural because we're, we have synergistic personalities. The other half, the half that I thought was a problem and apparently thinks I'm a problem, we just have different ways of approaching things. So he went back to work and the next week he was driving down to these production plants to visit and he called me and I said, what's your plan? And he's, cause he always had a plan. And he said, I, I have no plan. And I was shocked. And I said, well, what are you gonna do? And he said, I'm gonna meet with these three people who happened to be three of the people that had filed these HR complaints. And I said, really, what are you gonna do with them? And he said, I don't care. We can go for a walk. I'll take them out for dinner. We can go out for a beer, coffee, whatever they prefer. And I said, well, that sounds great. What are you gonna talk about? And he said, I have no idea. I'm gonna follow my curiosity. I've realized that I have no idea who these people are. I don't know what they're interested in. I don't know if they have families. I don't know what they care about. I don't know what they do in their spare time. I wanna, I wanna get to know them as human beings. I'm gonna do a lot of listening. Long story short, the HR complaints were dropped and he figured out how to get in rapport with 
the other the half of the organization that didn't like him, that didn't trust him, they saw him as a know-it-all from New York, you know, a know-it-all authoritarian business leader. They hated him. They fell in love with them. Hmm. And it was simply because he had an insight that changed how he saw that part of his world. And because he had an insight that changed how he saw that part of his world, that part of his world changed. And he started showing up differently. And he started getting results this week that were impossible last week, including completely solving some really thorny HR issues. They just went away because people saw that they could trust him now. That's the power of, of insight and the power of seeing how something works. What was ironic to me, I mean, it wasn't ironic, but I was telling because one of the concerns people had was they were concerned that he'd gone off to work with a coach and he had drunk the Kool-Aid and now he was just putting on a show. And their concern for, for a, a month or two was, can we, we love it, the change, but can we trust it? Mm -hmm. And the CEO called me with that, with that concern. And I said, you can trust it because what's changed is what makes sense to him. He's not changing because someone told him to, or someone gave him a five-step process for doing it differently. He changed because what makes sense to him changed through his insight. And we always do what makes sense to us given what we think is true. So he was simply doing what made sense to him. It's just that what made sense to him has shifted. Yeah, radically. So now change was inevitable. It wasn't something that had to be hoped for, worked on, struggled with. It was inevitable because he had changed from the inside out. Mm -hmm. That's change that sticks to the ribs. I really like that point that you're making because again, it seems like what you share in the work that you do is so 180 degrees different from simply buying into what somebody else's strategies have been because they can't own it. Well, they told me to do it. This is the way to do it. So I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to treat my employees this way. I'm going to run the company this way because that's how it's done. And yet what I, I hear and what you're saying is that unless you can really own something that you, it's your understanding that has gone through a shift. It's just another thing to do that somebody else says to do and how can you, how can you, you can't get very far with that. You can't really get behind it. Right. I mean, that's a huge point. I'm reminded, um, I'm reminded of, uh, of um, being a parent and my teenage son who was, um, we used to joke that he was, a, we're Norwegian and uh, at least I am, my wife is from the British Isles, but we joke that my son was a Viking born a thousand years too late because he's very, very rambunctious, if you will. And uh, high school, sitting quietly in a high school classroom did not come easily for him. And he just went through a, a several year period of radical rebellion. And we went through several years of radical trying to be helpful and trying to solve the problem and trying to steer him in a, in a healthier way and 
trying to prevent him from getting kicked out of yet another school or getting arrested one more time. It was a tough time and, and, and there were times when he would disappear for months at, on a t at a time and we didn't know if he was alive or dead. And I just had to come to grips with, um, I just didn't know how to solve it. I didn't know how to help him. One morning I was working in my office at home and I heard a commotion upstairs and I went up to see what it was. And it was Chell making breakfast in the kitchen. My son's name is Chell. And uh, I was so stunned. I didn't, I was speechless. I, I, there was a part of me that wanted to start screaming at him. Where the hell have you been? Do you have any idea of the hell you've put us through? And the other, another part of me wanted to take him in my arms and just weep with joy that my son was alive. Here he is in the flesh, prodigal son come home. I didn't trust what was gonna come out of my mouth. So I just turned around and went down back to my office. And I'm pacing back and forth thinking, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I can't do nothing. So, Chell's home, should I call my wife? What should I do? I, I had no idea. Once I'd calmed down, because I knew that was important, I went back up to, for a second try. And Chell was sitting on the couch watching SpongeBob SquarePants on TV. So I had this choice point, which we often have in life. And, and as leaders, we have these same choice points where we can go down the path of what our intellect and our experience tells us we should do versus turning in the other direction and stepping into the, well, with the, the art of possibility that you and I talked about once. Um, the Xanders, they would talk about stepping into the sea of infinite possibility. And so I chose to turn towards the unknown, toward, in, towards the sea of infinite possibility to see what was coming up because I tried everything over here we had talked to the counselors, we taught, read the books, we'd gone to counselors, we'd done therapy, we tried everything and, and, and how all backfired. So the moment I turned towards the unknown, it occurred to me to go and just sit on the couch and watch SpongeBob SquarePants with Chell. So I sat down and we watched the first half of the show and the ads came on and he turned, turned the sound down and he just looked at me expectantly, like, what, what was I going to say? And I had the next point of decision. Do I start saying what I think might be helpful? Or do I once again step into the sea of infinite possibility and see what comes up? I did the latter. And what came up was to ask him a simple question. What do you love about SpongeBob. Because I knew he loved the show. I had no interest in it whatsoever. I wasn't interested in cartoons. I was much too grown up and serious for that. What do you love about SpongeBob SquarePants after not seeing my son for three to four months and not knowing if he was alive? Those were the first words I said to him. Now, if I'd written a book about how to help rambunctious teenagers, there would not have been a chapter on watching SpongeBob SquarePants. This was completely new to me. So he proceeded to tell me what he loved about the show. And he had some really thoughtful things to say. And then we proceeded to watch the second half. And now I'm watching it with completely fresh eyes. And I start to really appreciate wow, there is some good writing here. This is actually, there's some, there's some intelligence built into this show. I'm impressed. The show ends and uh, he turns it off. Another pause. And then he, and he asks, well, Pop, what have you got to say? You've always got something. 
there was just a bit of edge to it. And there were many times in the past where that would have been enough to trigger me. Well, let me tell you what's on my mind. <laughs> where should I begin? <laughs> With the arrests, the drugs, the friends, the running away, the, you know, where should I begin? But I knew for a fact that whatever, however I chose to enter into that conversation, it just wasn't going to be helpful. I knew that intu intuitively. I knew it was absolutely true. So once again, I turned away from that and looked into the unknown. And what occurred to me to say was, I looked him in the eye and I said, I have no idea how to be your dad. I don't know how to do this. Mm. I love you, but I don't know how to be the kind of dad that you need. Having lost my own when I was six, I desperately wanted to be a good dad. I've been trying my best, but it clearly hasn't been very effective. And I'm really, really sorry. Mm. And I meant it. I meant it. And then we stood up and we just embraced and we just wept together. Mm. That was the day our relationship changed. That was the moment our relationship changed. What a story. I, I love it for so many reasons. Excuse me for interrupting. Go ahead. Going into that, you know, the in the Zen tradition, they talk about the don't know mind. And I, what I hear in that story, and, and as you've been talking this morning, how we don't know. But if we're if we're willing to be honest and vulnerable and just see that talk about a sea of possibilities it it makes it makes sense it it sounds a little bit scary for people who are used to doing I'm going to do this now and a rigid control and strategy and formula and step-by-step -step process, but, you know, do in all in, in the hopes of doing the right thing, but we don't know. Yeah, what do you do if everything that you normally do to succeed in life, to get your straight A's and to get your promotions and, um, you know, to get the spouse that you were hoping to and all of, all of that, and then you come up against something that you can't solve where every tr you've tried every trick in the book and it's not working. You've been working yourself to the bone. There's no question about your effort, your motivation, but it's not working, then what? Yeah. And I think that the, the really, really good news is that that I've discovered in my, my life is that it's, um, thank God it's not all on me. Yeah. It's not all, that? it's not all up to me. I didn't, I didn't come up with a strategy for how to connect with my son. I tried for years to come up with a strategy for how to connect with my son, how to help him, how to support him, how to love him, how to guide him. In the end, it blew up in my face. It blew up in our faces. My wife were, and I were just a great team, but it just, it didn't work. So I, th I think that there's, um, there's clearly a benevolent creative intelligence that flows through all of life. that as human beings, we can tap into if we know how to do it. That can guide us, support us, inform us. 
if we will but let it. The trick is getting our thinking out of the way, getting our thought constructs out of the way, our belief systems, our um, thought systems. We're so busy thinking all day long from the moment we wake up till we go to sleep at night that there's no spaciousness between our thoughts for the inkling to get through. So I, I talk about this as the noise to signal ratio. With the uh, executive that I was working with at his beach house last week, we talked about how his noise to signal ratio was completely out of whack. The noise level was a cacophony, an overwhelming cacophony of demands on his time. You're talking about in his own head? In his own head, thank you. In his own head, it was just unbearable. But when his mind settled and we talked the following week, he was feeling really good. And he said, I've got so many, I've had so many insights in the last few days about how to fix problems here in our company and how to, how to overcome challenges. Um, I barely know where to begin. That's what's available to us, but we have to create space for it. We have to create a certain spaciousness in our, in our minds so that insight can break through. If you think about the, um, the SpongeBob story, the noise was the history all the stories, all the worries, all the things I was angry about, all the things I was concerned about. I was genuinely concerned that he was throwing his life away. I was genuinely concerned that he was making decisions that would affect him for decades, if not the rest of his life. I had a lot of noise, but I'd been trying to solve and serve and support and love him from within the, that context, the context of all that noise, and it wasn't working. Out of desperation, really, I turned to the simplicity of silence. I basically said, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. And in that moment of silence, of giving up, of surrendering to the not knowing, life supported me, God supported me, spirit supported me, mind supported me. I don't care what language you use. Um, with this client, the language he was, that he was comfortable with was life force. He wasn't a religious or a, sp a spiritual person by his estimation, but he agreed that there seemed to be some kind of life force behind life. Mm. And so we used that. And I said, okay, trust that. Do you see that there's something behind life that breathes life and energy and creativity and wisdom and common sense through all of us? We can access that. Let's use that. Thank God it's not all up to us. There's something so freeing about realizing that, you know, when you, when you say it's up to us, that means we have to figure it out. And exactly. our little key brains can only go so far with that. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter how smart you are or how many years of experience you have or how many degrees you have or letters behind your name or um, what your credentials are. One of the things that, that we do when we're, we have these mastermind projects with people around the world and, and they're creative, um, the whole point is to access a deeper level of creativity and imagination in order to create impact in the world. Uh, so one of those programs is called Dream Run. And the whole point is to tap imagination for impact in the world. 
And one of the things that we do is make crystal clear when they're asking for help, the difference between asking for what people know about X versus asking people to help you discover something new about X. So if you, let's say there are eight people on your team and imagine eight circles, intertwined circles. Those are the circle, those circles represent the people on your team. And each circle represents the sum total of everything that person has learned through living life from church, from school, from their professional career. And when you ask the question, what do you know about X? That's the traditional brainstorming question. That's what masterminds have done for decades. And there's great value in that because if you imagine those arrow, those um, circles, those inner 10 interlocking circles, the arrows would then point from the outside into the circles. You're asking what, what you're taking advantage of the fact that collectively we know a lot more than I do personally. So, and you're tapping into that database. But where it really gets juicy and where you really start to have the possibility for breakthrough ideas and game-changing ideas is the other question. Can you help me discover something new about X? Mm -hmm. That's not brainstorming, that's wondering. Yes. Which has a qualitative difference from brainstorming. Now, if you're gonna diagram that, Imagine those 10 circles intersecting, but now the arrows are starting inside the circle and they're pointing out into the sea of infinite possibility. Now the whole focus is to discover something that lies beyond what we currently know. You're traveling into the unknown. You're doing exactly what I did in the SpongeBob story. You're turning away from what you know, not that that doesn't have value, but you're looking to discover something new. That's where the breakthroughs tend to happen. That's how you find simplicity in the face of complexity. That's where you experience the signal versus the noise. That takes you to the closer to the heart of things. That's what happened with, with uh, the client who had the insight about rapport. That's what happened with the sales team that was so full of noise about disliking each other. And then when they settled down, what they saw is, well, really as human beings, we all want the same thing. We wanna get along, we wanna enjoy work and we wanna kick it out of the park, hit it out of the park. Why don't we do that instead? <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is such a great story. And I I could see that, you know, the arrows going one way and then out into that sea of infinite possibilities that somehow reminds me of a Beatles song, but <laughs> you know which one? Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> not sure. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of them where I think they were saying something similar. We do all want ultimately want the same thing. How we get to it is really everything. It's really everything. And you're uh, emphasizing that willingness to self-examine. How am I thinking? Questioning my thinking. How am I being? What am I? What's the the vantage point or the disadvantage point that I'm coming from is just so essential. And, and as you were, the stories that you've been telling, they, they have such a profound consequence when we begin to s examine them, that everything can change. Yeah, just think of the power of that statement, everything can change, anything can change. Mm. There's such a pervasive notion in the world that people don't change. Well, the only reason that people don't change is because they don't see their own 
thought system for what it is. It's just a collage of thinking that they picked up along the way that they've decided is important and real. And so they're living as if that's true. But as soon as somebody sees it for something, no, nothing more or nothing less than what it is, it's just thought. It's a thought construct. It's not the truth about life. It's not who I am. It's not anything but the thought struck that we happened upon by living life. Once we wake up to the fact of that, we recognize, well, I, I can think other things too. I can discover new ways of thinking. I can discover new ways of seeing. Then change is inevitable. Let's do that. Yeah, let's live there. Well, I really appreciate your sharing your time with me today. And I wonder if as we wrap up, you could just share your website and how people can find you and what you've got going on these days that they might want to take a look at. It's been a delight, Nina. Uh, I really love our conversations and uh, I look forward to having more with you along the way. Um, People can uh, connect with me through my website, clearmindadvisors.com. Um, they can email me at rolf at clearmindadvisors.com. And uh, the, most, um, the in most interesting thing I have coming up is a, a new um, creative mastermind program that's launching in about a month. And we're looking to handpick we, we don't um, advertise these things, as, but we really, so what we're looking for is 10 or 12 people that want to go on an adventure with us, who really want to, um, uh, I think, metabolize the creative process for themselves mm -hmm. in such a way that they intuitively understand how they create in the world and how they can leverage that understanding to create the impact that they want to create in the world. Our next one launches in about a month. And um, the, way, the way that somebody could get involved in that is just to reach out to me and have a conversation. And if it feels like a good fit, I would invite them to be a part of it. Sounds like a pretty simple invitation. Yeah. It's a really, it's a fun journey. And then our, what we do is we set it up in a way that when, when, the, when our six month journey together is complete, then, then we make it possible for people to stay connected and support each other in, in their creative journey. It's just, I, I love doing it. It's really fun. Sounds great. Well, thank you again, Rolf. Just been such a special treat to have you and for those of you who've been listening or watching thank you i hope you've gotten as much out of it as i have this morning and stay tuned we will see you on the next episode so bye for now mm -hmm.